What's up, guys, and welcome to my top 10 picks for the best movies of 2023. First, I want to apologize, and I want to thank you for your patience. Uh, look, usually this video goes up at the end of the year, you know, right around December, early January. But look, when you have uh, now a 10-month-old son, it's it's harder to see all the new releases as fast. So you got to wait for digital and, you know, 4K and Blu-ray for some of these things. So I wanted to wait and see as many things as I possibly could to add in contention for this list. And I feel very comfortable and very confident. I feel most confident with this list. This is the, one of the most confident top 10 best movie lists of the year that I've made in a very long time. And I've been doing this for a very long time. So without further ado, we've got honorable mentions. Now, let me just say, look, if you disagree with any of these picks, let's have a civil conversation about it down in the comments section. Let's not get uh, aggressive. I know sometimes people like to people like to think that their opinion is the right opinion. They go ahead and, you know, uh, bash on their keyboards and give a lot of hate uh, and negativity. And that's just not what we're here for. So this is just strictly my opinion. And uh, yeah, maybe you'll agree. Maybe you'll disagree. It's open to conversation. So we have a bunch of honorable mentions. This has been an incredible year for film. 2023 is one of the best years for movies in recent memory. Towards the end of the year, the last two, three months of the year, we were blasted with nothing but excellence. I mean, of course, there were some average films along the way, but so many great movies, excellent movies, came out at the end of the year. It was staggering. So without further ado, my honorable mentions for the top 10 of the year, just missed the list, are Are You There, God? It's Me, Margaret. Guardians of the Galaxy, Volume 3. John Wick, Chapter 4. Barbie. Air. Saltburn. American Fiction. Past Lives and Anatomy of a Fall. You might be thinking, wow, uh, those you know could have been the top 10 list. So what in the world did make the list? Well, let's get started with number 10, a film that I just saw recently within the last few weeks that blew me away. It's Godzilla Minus One. This movie, I you know, have been showcasing my Godzilla Funko Pop. I love Godzilla. love the character, the, the whole thing. And uh, this movie... Is the ultimate Godzilla film. You know, the Warner Brothers movies that they're doing, Godzilla is more of like an anti hero. He's not scary. This film, Godzilla was terrifying. Absolutely terrifying. And he, and he you know, every time he came on the screen, you know, you feel the presence. And um, he was very scary. And it wasn't just, you know, about him and, and the presence of Godzilla. The characters were great. And the story was great. And within the first sequence of the film, you're able to sink your teeth into it, and it just takes off from there. So Godzilla Minus One, it's not in theaters anymore, but if it comes on digital, physical media, I highly recommend it. And look, I haven't seen every Godzilla movie, but of the ones I've seen, this is the best. Moving into number nine, a movie that was completely disrespected by the studio who put it out on physical media and just how it was handled. Uh, the ninth pick for me is Blackberry. This is a film, when I say disrespected, I mean it only got a DVD release. This movie didn't even get a Blu-ray release. And it's a great film about the rise and fall of the Blackberry. Jay Barshall, you know, could have been nominated for Best Actor for this. This is the best I've ever seen this guy. Glenn Howerton, this guy should have gotten a Best Supporting Actor nomination. This movie should have gotten a Best Picture nomination, Screenplay nomination, I mean, this could have got in for editing, score. I mean, this is a great, fast-paced, fast-moving film with an excellent screenplay. I mean, this is a, 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 a film that is, it feels like it's on speed, but in the best way possible. I love this movie. It's so watchable, so entertaining. And I love watching these characters. I love watching these people and on this, on this journey. And, and the progression of BlackBerry... And the ultimate fall of it, this guy, he's got devil horns for a reason. I mean, he's, wow. I mean, what a performance, what a film. If you haven't seen Blackberry, check it out. 
And I hear that they're doing a, a TV miniseries, a three-part miniseries, cutting this movie into three parts or something like that, adding new footage. I have no idea what that's all about. But, I mean, this is a great movie. And they're just, I don't know what they're thinking and what's going on there. But it's a, it's a great film, and I highly recommend it. And it's available on DVD. Probably not in stores, but you could probably find it online. So, look, number eight is a film that surprised me. I knew I would probably like it, but I didn't think I'd like it as much as I did. And that's Poor Things. Yorgos Lanthimos' last film, The Favorite, uh, I liked, but I thought that maybe it was a little too artsy. And by the end of the film, the way that it ends and the last shot of it, it was just like, okay, um, didn't love that, but it was all right. This film, you know, he... He totally hones down his tone and creates a film, creates a character in Bella Baxter, played by Emma Stone, who'll probably win the Oscar for this, who is, you know, completely three dimensional. And you can see the full journey of the life of Bella Baxter. And I thought it was so well realized, extremely, extremely captivating. I mean, Mark Ruffalo steals the show, and this Willem Dafoe is also fantastic. Uh, the score, everything about it. It's nominated for a lot of Oscars. It'll probably win a couple of Oscars. The production design, the costume design, all great stuff. And, th you know, I have a full review up for this film on the channel now, but I do think that there's like a 15-minute chunk that kind of slowed down for me, felt a little repetitive, but it didn't take away from my enjoyment of Poor Things. So that's why it's number eight. Number seven is a film that's on nobody's list. And it's a film that came out, I think it came out in the, the, the middle of the year. I don't really remember the month it came out, but it, it just kind of swept itself under the rug. It came out on digital. It came out on streaming, actually. This is a Hulu film. And it's called No One Will Save You. This movie is practically a silent film. Uh, Caitlin Deaver is the star. And what she's able to do without having any dialogue, but to convey the, the emotion of, of the, the action in the film, the, the tense scenes, the physical scenes, the emotional scenes, the, the, the scenes where she's, you know, every emotion. This is a pitch-perfect performance who, look, no one nominated this damn girl for, for anything. Now, I think, what did she get nominated for? She got nominated for something. Uh, Critics' Choice Awards? I don't know. I know she was nominated somewhere for this, but it's a great movie. It's such a great movie with a great story with hardly any dialogue, but you can you could get it and you feel it. This movie made me feel, and by the end of it, it felt like a total experience, and I would have loved to see this in the movie theater. Now, hopefully it gets a 4K release because now Sony has apparently taken control of Disney's physical media production. So hopefully... Just like the film Prey, which is also a Hulu film, hopefully no one will save you. We'll get a physical media release. Let's move on to number six. It's a big one. It's on a lot of people's lists. It's Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse. This movie takes the first movie and elevates it completely. This is one of the longest animated films of all time, with about two hours and 20 minutes, including end credits. This movie transcends the animated genre. This feels like it could be a live-action film. The story is mature, but it's family-friendly. Miles Morales takes, the, takes the, the lead in ways that he hasn't done in the first film, but this is so, very much Gwen Stacy's stories as well. She opens the film. She gets the first 20 minutes of the film, which is basically a prologue, so we can understand more about her and her character. And by the end of the film, guess what? She does find her team, and she does find her band, and she can feel confident in that and i think this this is an incredible film with the spot spider-man 2099 the voice acting daniel pemberton's euphoric score which could have gotten an oscar nomination i mean this is a terrific film a terrific animation and i can't wait to see how it's going to wrap up and if it's just as good as the first two this will be not just one of the best animated trilogies of all time but one of the best film trilogies of all time so now we move on to number five which is a film that people decided to turn against. A lot of people decided to hate on this film because of the filmmaker. 
thinking that he just wants to go and win his Oscar. Maybe that's the case, but it's Maestro, written and directed by Bradley Cooper. Also starring Bradley Cooper is Leonard Bernstein, starring Carrie Mulligan as well as his wife. Uh, this movie, I watched it twice. The first time I watched it, I really liked it. The second time I watched it, I, w- I loved it. When I knew what it was about, and I knew the story, and I knew what was going to happen, knowing that, I watched it again, and I was totally taken by the story and the romance. This is a romance movie at its core. It's not particularly about Leonard Bernstein and how he makes his music. Sure, that stuff's in there. The incredible conducting scene when he's conducting the Mahler the second or whatever it is in the big chapel. I mean, he's incredible, and he could win the Oscar for that scene alone. But another scene that kind of blew me away is the scene that takes place in the hotel room. When he comes in, he says, hey, you left my toothbrush and my pillow outside the door. The door was locked. I haven't seen you. What's the deal? And she starts talking to him about uh, all sorts of things. The argument that they have. What an incredible scene. Uh, Tour de force acting from Carrie Mulligan and Bradley Cooper. Uh, and just by the end of the film, it's, it's, it's heartfelt and it's, it's memorable. And it stuck with me, and hopefully this will be picked up by Criterion to get a 4K Blu-ray, because I know they do a lot of uh, Netflix's films. Moving on to number four, it's Killers of the Flower Moon. Uh, Martin Scorsese's three-and-a-half-hour epic of a film that feels extremely important. This movie, you know, when you're watching it, it feels like you're watching something it just feels like you're watching something important, and it feels like you're watching something from a master, which you are. Martin Scorsese's direction is this kind of subtle, but it's powerful. The performances, look, Robert De Niro gives one of the best performances of his career. Lily Gladstone is incredible. Leonardo DiCaprio, he's good in the film, but the character he plays is a complete bitch, and he's very unlikable, and that could be a reason why he wasn't nominated for Best Lead Actor, but, you know, don't like that character. And I, uh, it's not easy to get behind him because the film follows him. So you, you don't necessarily want to watch him succeed because of how much of a scumbag he really is. But in the end of the day, Killers of the Flower Moon is extremely entertaining. It's never boring. And at three and a half hours long, I was like, you know what, just like The Irishman, I was invested. And I loved the whole thing. And with this and The Irishman, I mean, Martin Scorsese, he, he, he's still, he's, he's, he's at it later, later in his life, and he's still creating films like this that I'm, so happy that we still have this kind of filmmaker in Hollywood right now. So now we're at the top three. Number three is a film that I saw within the last month. It's The Iron Claw, a film that I was extremely disappointed that it didn't receive any nominations anywhere. Golden Globes, Critics' Choice, BAFTA, Oscars, none of it. This could have gotten Best Picture, Best Actor. Zac Efron is extremely powerful in this film, and, and he steals the show, and he's he, he's the heart and soul of the movie. He transforms himself. He, he looks like this Kevin Von Erich. I mean, he's really incredible in this. The supporting cast, Jeremy Allen White, is great. There's a scene that takes place involving him in the last 15 minutes of the film that, you know, it's a reunion scene that ripped my heart out of my chest. I mean, it was, I, I mean, I, I, I wanted to cry my eyes out. I mean, it was so powerful, so moving, and the whole film is. It's it's a film about film about love. It's a film about family. It's a film about loss and grief. So many things, and I think it just is a it's an excellent film and it's a masterpiece. And I can't wait till it comes on physical media so I can own it because uh, this is a great movie. If you haven't seen The Iron Claw, it's available on digital now. But keep in mind, you need a box of tissues when you see this movie. Number two is a film that I saw a bunch of times. I watched, I rewatched this movie a lot. I love this movie. It's a film that I'm going to see myself continuing to rewatch uh, every Christmas season. It's The Holdovers. Uh, Alexander Payne, you know, again, kind of subtle direction. But Paul Giamatti steals the damn movie as Paul Hunnam. He is incredible as the, 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 the teacher that, that he's unlikable, but he's lovable and likable at the same time. Uh, you know, just the dialogue, the screenplay, the whole thing. His pr- relationship with Angus, played by Dominic Sessa, Divine Joy Randolph's incredible, you know, subtle, again, subtle performance. But there's a scene that she has in a kitchen at a party where she's breaking down, and the, her line there 
is like, okay, I get what you're you're doing. And she's incredible in this movie. And this is just such a rewatchable, heartwarming, likable film, extremely well made. And by the end of it, I said, this is a modern, timeless classic. And the holdovers have been available on digital, it's available on Blu-ray, Blu and all of that right now. And I highly recommend you watch it. Number one, probably not a surprise to any of you, but this is not just one of the best films of the year. It's one of the best films of the past, I don't know, five years, ten years? I have no idea. And certainly my favorite Christopher Nolan film, it's Oppenheimer. This is a film that I, you know, throw in on 4K Blu-ray occasionally. Just had it in for a little bit yesterday. And, you know, as soon as it starts, you are thrust in. I mean, the, the filmmaking at hand here is masterful. Every single craft and department, you are getting excellence. You are getting bombarded with excellence in writing and directing and acting and scoring and editing and production design and set decoration, all of it. This movie is a masterclass. It is a total masterpiece. At three hours long, it flies by. Robert Downey Jr. is completely transformative in this. He's going to win the Oscar, deservingly so. Killian Murphy is, I mean, the, 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 geez, the voice he's using, the facial expression. Killian Murphy steals his damn movie. I mean, does he steal the movie? Everybody steals the movie. This is a huge cast. This is a huge ensemble. Emily Blunt, I've never seen her better. She received her first Oscar nomination for this. Guess what? It's completely deserving. She is so fantastic. Christopher Nolan brings the best out of every single person that comes in to work on this movie. And I love it. It's my favorite Nolan film. And look, when it came out, I said this, The Dark Knight, and Inception are my three favorite Nolan films. What, what is it? Well, I've made my mind. Oppenheimer is his best movie. And it's one of it's one of my favorite movies. I love this film. I love it. I mean, the Albert Einstein stuff, the way it ends. I mean, it it is. It's it's gush worthy. I want to gush on this movie. You chew into it; it's like a gusher. Excellence just oozes out. And that's why it's number one. Look, last year, Top Gun: Maverick was my number one. Oppenheimer is a better film. Oppenheimer almost transcends cinema <laughs> it's that good i i loved it i love this movie and that's where i'm at so guys look that's my picks for the top 10 best movies of 2023 i am so confident with this list now look is there a couple films that i haven't seen sure the the, the biggest film that i haven't seen that i could throw into contention to this is the boy and the heron i have no idea when that's going to be available to watch and i'm not going to wait any longer to put up this video because look it's getting it's winning all these animated feature awards so I, I can't imagine i'm gonna like it more than spider-verse but I, i'm gonna give it its due and of course i will review it whenever i see it so what are your thoughts on this what are some of your favorite movies of 23 comment that down below also don't forget to hit that subscribe button we got a bunch of 2024 films that we're gonna be seeing and reviewing guess what dune part two gonna be seeing that next thursday and putting out a review for it after i'm so excited to see this movie hey guys you can follow me on Twitter and or X at Ryan King 72 and Instagram and TikTok at King Arises 131. And that's about it for me. Thank you so much for watching this video of my top 10 picks for the best films of 2023. And until next time, over and out.